We're following other news out of Iran. Officials say a Ukrainian passenger plane crashed shortly after takeoff, killing everyone on board. The Boeing 737 jet went down overnight after leaving Tehran's international airport. Video taken shortly after the crash shows flames and debris scattered in a field in the city's outskirts. There were 176 souls on board. CBS News transportation correspondent Chris Van Cleve is following this story. He joins us now from Washington with the very latest. So, Chris, what do we know at this point about the accident? Well, whatever happened, happened quickly. The plane only transmitted about two minutes of flight data before it stopped transmitting and fell from the sky. Now, there is some unverified video that has been played on Iranian television that purports to show the airplane on fire coming into the ground. Uh, we have not been able to, to verify that video, of course, and you have to take anything that comes from Iranian media with the proper amount of skepticism. They are not necessarily known for their accuracy, but this was a very new airplane. It was uh, less than three years old. It's a 737-800. It is not a 737 MAX. It is the previous generation 737, and those airplanes, some of the most commonly used in the world, have a strong safety record over the last 20-plus years. So uh, there are a lot of questions about what could have happened here. The Iranians have said a mechanical failure. There's been some reporting of a possible engine fire, uh, but at this point, we really don't know. The black boxes apparently were just recovered. So anytime somebody is offering a suggestion about what could have happened before you've really even looked at the evidence uh, is just speculating at best. So, you know, you point out that getting our information from Iranian state television can be particularly challenging. In fact, there are new challenges when it comes to the investigation because of where the plane went down. That's right. So typically in a crash investigation involving a U.S. made airplane or a U.S. airline, the FAA, the NTSB, and in this case Boeing, the plane manufacturer, uh, would be a party to that investigation. Uh, we would have access to information. They often would send a team, uh, even if it's abroad, to help with the investigation. Well. The U.S. can't travel to Iran, so the NTSB can't go. Iran's not going to give access uh, to whatever the black box is recorded uh, to Boeing or to, or to U.S. authorities for, for obvious reasons at this point. Keep in mind, this plane went down uh, within hours of Iran bombing two U.S. military bases. So, uh, you know, there are going to be a lot of questions about what caused this crash, if it really was mechanical, if it was something else. The airline says the plane was well-maintained. This was a very experienced flight crew. Uh, so there, there are a lot of questions here, and, and I think there are certainly U.S. experts that are, are worrying today that we may never know definitively what happened here. So we talked a little bit about Boeing. Speaking of Boeing, Chris, this isn't, of course, related to this crash, but the company is now recommending flight simulator training for pilots of its 737 MAX. So stepping away from what just happened uh, in, in the case of this crash, tell us more about this pilot training that's being required. Sure thing. So the 737 MAX, which was not involved in this crash in Iran, has been grounded worldwide now for uh, about 10 months. Um, the Boeing had been saying uh, for some time here that they felt that um, computer-based, uh, basically uh, something you could do on a laptop training, would be sufficient uh, to go over the changes in the 737 MAX for pilots. Well, there was an, an, a group of 737 line pilots from several U.S. and some foreign airlines that flew the MAX with its new software update through a series of uh, simulated emergencies. And what they noticed here, both Boeing and the FAA, what stood out to them was while the pilots all successfully flew the plane and avoided uh, an issue and navigated their way through the problems. About half of them didn't use the existing protocols, procedures, or checklists to do it. They relied on airmanship. They basically flew their way out of a problem. Um, but because they didn't follow existing procedures, that has led Boeing to believe that it may actually be necessary to have simulator training for pilots before they can uh, fly the 737 MAX, before it can return to service. 
Now that means a couple of things. Analysts expect that could further delay the return to service and mean it would be more gradual than first thought and could present some real logistical challenges for airlines because Boeing sold this airplane on the promise that there wouldn't be additional training and now if you have only certain pilots can fly the 737 MAX and the MAX is a small part of your larger fleet, it creates problems for an airline like Southwest that only flies the 737 and currently all of their pilots can fly any of their planes. Now you have to, at least for some period of time, subfleet the airplane. It, it creates some logistical issues and, and could cost Boeing millions because they have a deal with Southwest that Southwest will get a million dollar a plane discount if pilots have to go through simulator training. Um, certainly, um, if you're Boeing, you, you'll, you'll pay that penalty to, to make sure the planes are safe. But uh, this was one of the, the, the fundamental selling points of the MAX, that this wouldn't be required. Uh, so the fact that Boeing decided to tell the FAA that it now supports simulator training caught people at the FAA by surprise, caught the airlines by surprise, and pilots unions who were expressing some real frustration that they weren't included in the conversation when Boeing made this decision. Hmm. All right, Chris, thank you very much. Sure thing.